Good morning, everybody. Welcome. I hope everybody can hear me. Can I um, get some thumbs up or, or yeses in the chat to make sure we're good to go? Awesome. Welcome. Uh, my name is Natalie Hennigan. I'm the Education Manager at Rethos Places Reimagined, which is the sponsor and host of this class alongside the Nicolette County Historical Society. Uh, it's great to have many of you um, joining us after attending our first class in this series. Um, so if you were at that first one, you heard my spiel about how we had this great vision of hosting some in-person hands-on workshops here at the beautiful Cox House in St. Peter. Um, and of course, uh, best laid plans, right? So we have transitioned all of our, our programs to um, virtual classes and workshops here. But we're really excited. Our instructor, Laura, and I are here at the Cox House um, and we'll be doing some demonstrations on uh, Windows straight from this house. So, oh, Linda, can you hear me? Is your, I see that you're uh, might having, be having some issues. So I just wanna be sure. Oh, I see you're connecting to audio. Cool. Okay. Hopefully, hopefully you'll be with us soon. Um, so uh, I just want to give um, thanks to the uh, Historic Preservation Education Foundation, um, which is the, we, we received a grant from HPEF to host this series of classes, as well as the um, uh, Minnesota Historical Society for their support of our education program. Um, as many of you know, Rethos's education program features a wide range of classes. Um, this year we have hosted classes about lead and asbestos, about sustainability in older homes, plaster repair. The last class in this series was about um, doing a conditions assessment of your, of your older or aging home. So um, thank you so much for your support of our program despite the, um, the unexpected circumstances of this year. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. How it's going to work today, um, Laura, our, our instructor, is going to do um, a, a little bit of uh, discussion and, and presentation about the merits of, of window restoration, about common issues we see with windows and rot specifically in windows. Um, and then we're going to take a little bit of a break. And we're gonna uh, readjust our, our setup here and, uh, and, and prepare for some live demonstrations. So we have actually turned the living room of this beautiful Victorian into a little window workshop. Um, so I'm excited for us to uh, share some of these um, uh, repair methods with you all. Um, and please also feel free to uh, use the chat as much as you'd like and ask any questions of our instructor. Um, and uh, and we will um, hopefully have have a great uh, discussion conversation here. So um, I'm going to pass this spot off to Laura, um, and uh, yeah, and then we'll get going. Ready to rock? Okay. okay, great. Thank you so much, everybody. Hello. Just going to get situated here really quick. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, being here today. I'm super excited to take you through um, a number of different, um, I guess, of a lot of different information about raw and windows. Two things I'm probably a little too um, passionate about at times, but uh, hopefully you all will be too by the end of this. Um, so my name is Laura Lepink, and a little bit of my background is that I um, recently graduated from the University of Minnesota Heritage Studies and Public History program. Um, uh, and my emphasis was in historic preservation. Um, so I really like to do publicly engaged historic preservation work, which is obviously what Rethos does. So I'm excited to be here with them. Um, and besides that, I worked as a, um, I worked as a, um, sorry, I worked as a um, hands-on preservation trades person out in um, California and Wyoming, um, and that's really where I gained a lot of my experience, but have done a little bit more since I've been in, um, since I've been in uh, Minnesota. So with that, I'm going to see if I can make sure I make this work properly. So I did want to give a little bit of an introduction to the Cox House, just because it's such an amazing property. 
Um, uh, so the Historic Hawks House is located in St. Peter, Minnesota, and it's owned by the Nicollet County Historical Society. And really, it's one of the few fully restored Carpenter Gothic cottages in Minnesota, which is pretty amazing. It's a very distinct style. Um, and the house was built by Eugene uh, uh, St. Uh, Julian Cox and his wife, Mariah, in 1878. And they raised their daughters, uh, Lillian, who became the first woman mayor of Minnesota, and also Irene, who became one of the first women attorney in Minnesota. So um, for its architectural and social significance, the Cox House was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1970. Um, a little bit of work history in the house includes um, that the both the Cox House and Carriage House were damaged in a March 1998 tornado in St. Peter, uh, Minnesota, um, but it was repaired and it continues to be used for various uh, functions by the society and the community. Okay, and to look here. So um, I did want to do a little introductions. I gave you mine and I gave the house introduction, but I would love to know what brought you to the class and what you're hoping to learn. It helps me know maybe what to focus on, but also, you know, once we get to the end, uh, you all can share a little bit of questions and things that you're thinking about as well. So feel free to unmute yourself. Otherwise, I'm going to um, uh, just uh, take a look at the chat function as well. I'm going to find this. I don't know if I can see it. Oh, I think I found it. There we are. Great. Oh, figure this out. So sorry. My apparently I'm not great at the Zoom thing. Don't know what that was. Um, great. Oh, hello, everyone. Um, great. Um, so I see a number of things here. Um, I have one person who said, I love old houses and want to be able to keep the original windows without replacing them with new ones. Um, another person says, owner of an 1875 home in Stillwater, Minnesota, lots of old windows to repair. Um, um, Erica Kelson said, old house from 1895, windows need some attention. Most places want to replace versus restore which is very true, and we'll talk about that today. Um, and uh, Colleen Bell says, I live in a 1926 duplex that is beautiful in many ways. Windows need new cords, glazing, et cetera. They are windy. Um, yes, they can be a little blustery sometimes, um, depending on kind of the weatherization and the different maintenance they're in. Um, and then Ethan Boot says, I live in an old house in Uptown and hope to own an old home one day and want to learn more about old windows. Okay. So, and did anybody, um, oh, I see what might be the problem. I'm gonna turn on the volume so I can, okay. So if you had said something, I may have missed it. So please speak up again. Um, I see another comment that says, own a 1919 Craftsman home in Duluth, looking to understand my home better and how to maintain it. So I apologize, I think I had the sound off, um, but if you did say something, uh, please speak up again. I would love to hear more. Hi, um, I'm in Rochester and I own a mid-century uh, home from 1950. And um, we have uh, various issues with rot, as everyone does, I think, and uh, windows to some extent. Um, and we also get a lot of questions from others. So we just are hoping to sort of update our skills. We appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Definitely. Um, it's great to see kind of like a range of different um, dates and eras of buildings because rot repair, you know, we'll talk about kind of old double hung wood windows, but rot repair and wood repair um, is something that can be applied to any era of home. Um, so thank you for coming and everything. Um, did anybody else have anything else they would like to share before we kind of delve into everything? Okay, well, we're going to move on and talk about rot. And so I'm going to close this here. Um, and so 
what I hope you all can see um, is a uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is just understanding rot, you know, what it is, how it lives, how it thrives, and a little bit about water management because it's very inherently tied to um, fungal decay, mildew, a lot of these other kind of water-based issues. Um, and so a little bit about it. So really it needs food and its food is going to be the material, which is wood. However, fungi can other uh, can thrive in, off of other organic materials as well. Um, it really needs oxygen and it needs moisture and really needs, you know, about 12% and above moisture content for it to thrive and to, to spread in a piece of organic material. Um, and really the issue with decay and rot and everything like that is that it can actually cause other issues which include um, providing an environment for mold and insects and so often when I find rot in certain places I will also find just insects devouring it even more causing that decay to um, be exacerbated. Um, I think one of the other interesting things, if you want to say that, uh, about rot is that when it um, shrinks, it can kind of crack across the grain um, and it will actually destabilize wood, the structure of the wood. Um, what it can also do is if you have decay underneath finishes, that shrinking and cracking can cause finishes to uh, degrade over time as well. Um, the other thing I really like to talk about is the mycelia of fungi can extend way beyond what we think uh, uh, is actually there. Um, and so sometimes we'll see the fruiting body, which I'm going to share with you this lovely, I hope you can see this. This is our lovely fruiting body off of one of the windows we found. And so although we got this little piece off, um, the, the mycelia um, and this kind of lower kind of the root system almost of the fungi can extend into the rest of the wood and actually can affect beyond what we might see. And so we'll talk about preventative measures, but also treating kind of that greater system that may have been created by the fungi. Um, so on the right hand side, you see a little bit of an image and this is my water management image. I tend to share it a lot if you're on my last class, it's also there. Um, but what I love about this image is it shows all of the different things that can, uh, issues that can stem from water and moisture. Um, and this is, you know, you see the side that has fungal decay, but it also has pests and wear and damage. Um, and, um, it also has an issue with uh, weathering. And so this is really, it shows kind of the interconnectedness of a lot of these different issues. Um, a lot of it with the centering of moisture. Um, and without moisture, we don't have rot. And without moisture, we often don't see um, a lot of the other issues that pop up in old homes, new homes, um, pretty much anything. So when thinking about um, treating rot, what we also need to consider is so why do we have the amount of moisture that allows for that rot to happen? Um, because if we don't ultimately treat where that water is coming from and keep that water from infiltrating our organic materials in the home, then um, we're going to see continued degradation and often repeat issues with fungus and um, other issues due to moisture. Um, okay. And so let's talk a little bit about common places of rot. Um, um, in and around windows. Um, I'm making this a little bit window focused uh, and everything like that, but there are other obviously common places of rot around the home, but a lot of them follow some of the uh, very similar um, trends. Uh, and so one of the things that you'll see today in our live kind of showing here is that um, bottom rails and the lower parts of side rails um, often show the most damage. And in the images uh, in the bottom of this slide, you can see kind of the lower sections of these windows are the ones um, that show holes or look like they're damaged or the um, paint is coming off or maybe even on that left side photo is where the um, glazing is kind of coming out. Um, in one of the images, you see that vegetation that is Kind of is over the window. It's on the bottom part of that window and that vegetation ultimately will hold moisture against uh, the building and the window. Um, if we're talking about places around the window, so maybe not just the window sash, um, the bottom parts of trim, casing, and jams, so these lower areas again are really what hold moisture the most. 
um, the window sills and seats. And so there is kind of this difference. Um, the seat is kind of like that flat part on the inside of the house and the sill is kind of the piece of wood that is on the exterior of the house. So they do have two different names, but really need to know that uh, that piece of wood right at the bottom of the window will hold moisture the most. That's where things tend to gather, including dirt and other organic matter. I do want to especially recognize siding as also being something to be aware of whether you have vinyl siding or you have wood siding or um, anything like that. Um, when you have uh, a failure in your siding, it can actually cause dramatic damage to your wood window. It can be where the water is being let in. Um, but also siding is where other, like if you have wood siding, this is also a common place rock can exist. And from that siding can transfer into your windows and cause uh, more issues. So seeing kind of that transfer of um, moisture and rock issues from these um, adjacent materials. Um, so kind of in general, the rules of thumb is that, you know, you're going to find rot and this deterioration where there's high moisture areas and often where you know, they are not able to dry out over time. And I think what's critical to really understand is that we will not have rot, like if it's just moist, highly moist, it has a high moisture content for a short period of time. So rot means that 12% and above moisture content and the right oxygen and the um, good wood material, they need all of that for an extended period of time to spread and actually cause significant damage. And so um, we need to kind of uh, be aware of things over time, of like uh, if there's a side of the building is isn't getting as much sun, if there's an area that has cooling water, um, all of these things can indicate locations where you might have a higher chance of uh, rot and degradation. Um, and then also, like I pointed out before, so often around buildings where there's a lot of vegetation or even organic matter, um, this all holds moisture in. So the purpose of dirt, the purpose of these veg this vegetation is to hold that moisture in because what they want to do is grow and they want to fix that moisture um, right next to the building. Um, and this often comes up in the case where um, in and around your windows, you might have buildup of dirt and other debris. And although it might not impact that space initially, when you have a lot of dirt and other buildup, it actually will, you know, start creating an even better environment for rot to happen and for that moisture to uh, allow that moisture to be sitting there for an extended period of time. Um, let's see. Let's, we're going to um, move on to the next one. And I'd like to talk a little bit about um, just an overview of repair, treatment, and prevention. And so there's a reason I wanted to talk not just about repair and um, treatment and everything, but prevention often can be extremely important. Um, so what this graphic is showing, in essence, is that it's not often a easy one-step to the solution. And so I love this graphic just because what we're trying to do is fix the cause. We're not just trying to fix symptoms. And so just kind of like a doctor may look at your symptoms and try to figure out your underlying diagnosis, we're trying to look at all of our symptoms and figure out what the uh, cause and source of the issue might be. And so when I talk about needing to find where the water is infiltrating and why, it could be also a system of issues. It could be finish issues. It could be that the wood is having an issue. It could be craftsmanship that um, wasn't necessarily up to par. But what needs to happen is that you need to go through a process of diagno diagnosing what this issue is. Um, before getting to what the best repair is, what the best solution is. Um, and so uh, basically there's like different repair options and um, I'll talk a little bit about this in the live demonstration as well. Um, we can do wood replacement. So this is if your wood is so damaged that you might need to put a new piece in, that could be the entire you know, rail. So kind of that wood exterior of the window, you might need to replace the muttons, which are the cross sections, which divide the glass. Um, and you can do this in a number of different ways. You could replace in kind, which means you're using wood material or other material that is the exact same as the material that has been damaged and 
too much to save. And one of the interesting things here about the Cox House is they actually have extra storm windows. Um, and so um, in discussing how we might do some of these fixes um, on the really damaged portions, um, one of the options is, is to take parts of that other storm window and use that wood to um, replace the damaged components. That way we're maintaining the material integrity, um, but it also helps with you know, shaping the different profile and shape um, and the unique characteristics of that storm window. Um, you can also replace with new wood. And often what I will see happen is that this is with treated wood or you can treat wood after the fact with things like borates or other um, preservatives. Um, and that way, the, if it's often made, these older materials are made with old growth wood, which has a high level of moisture resistance, pest resistance, it's just overall a better material. Um, and so the closest thing we can sometimes get to that is you know, um, either treated wood or treating the wood yourself before installing and replacing that piece of wood. Um, the other kind of different options um, include a Poxy, which we'll talk about today. We'll do a demonstration of that because I know that's something that often people want to know how to use and how to do. Um, and the system that I use is Avatron, and we'll talk more about that. But mainly because they have a moldable epoxy that I think is particularly good at integrating with the wood. And that's already right extant. And um, the system, along with the penetrating epoxy or the liquid wood, uh, just means as an overall treatment process and it kind of, uh, it goes more than, it's, it's anything beyond, it's much beyond wood filler that we kind of typically understand. And when people ask what to do, do I fill this with wood filler? I mean, wood filler has a purpose. Maybe you're trying to fill in a small nail hole or something like that. But even so, I often recommend that using a high quality epoxy like Avatron wood epox is a much better option because it integrates with the material much better. Um, and so here are a few things to think about when um, uh, thinking about repair, treatment, and prevention. You need to consider um, what kind of material you want to use. Will you use something that is the same? Will you use something that is close to the same as possible? Um, or will you use like a new material, like an epoxy? Um, I think you also have to think about um, how different materials interact together. So when thinking about how the epoxy can integrate with the wood, that's um, how materials are interacting with one another. But you also can think about how, you know, silicone caulk might work with your wood and it often doesn't necessarily interact extremely well. Um, this is also thinking about um, when using something like a borate, which would be a preventative Borates are kind of basically salts that you can put into your wood. And what that will do is uh, kill the mycelia. And it will end up um, treating that wood and actually preventing rot because um, fungi, mildew, and all those other things do not like salty wood. That's kind of the whole reason of, of using that product. Um, but one thing you have to be careful about is if you overuse that um, with different finishes, it can actually cause that finish to not be able to adhere properly. So it's just, you know, reading the box, making sure you're not overusing a product, but also, you know, trying to make sure you do the research based on the finishes you might want to use if you want to use other materials such as wood epox or, you know, original wood or wood replacement. Um, and so I'm going to move on from here because I'm going to add, put a little bit more into uh, things to think about when you're starting your uh, wood project or like I say, your wood adventure because it always feels like an adventure. You open up so many old buildings and then you have a whole new uh, set of things you need to do. Um, so what you see below, uh, or what you see in the image on the screen, actually you can actually see the, the fruiting body, which I showed you earlier, which is this little bit. It's down in the little corner of the um, storm window. And uh, so that was growing there and it had a plenty and lovely time, but it has now been removed. Um, so there are a few things I like to think about when starting a window restoration project. And also often when I'm you know, advising people when they're first starting their projects. Um, the first thing is thinking about the level of restoration that you want to go to with your windows. Um, 
And so I heard little things like my glazing is failing or I don't have sash rope um, and kind of these different levels. Some I'm guessing is a little bit worse. Um, so I would say kind of the first level is almost like a maintenance level. And that means, you know, learning how to replace your um, sash rope and sash cord. Um, the other thing is if you have glazing that's starting to fail, your spot glazing. And so that's just taking a little bit of that glazing putty and putting it into places where the, um, the putty has worn away or fallen out. And so it's maintaining the integrity of the system and making sure that uh, putty is um, staying up to par um, over time. Um, and then also think about spot painting. And so this is, you know, not waiting till your sash has completely lost its paint or finish and things like that, but instead, you know, doing a little spot painting to make sure um, that finish is maintaining its integrity and protecting your wooden materials. And so those are kind of just little things you can do every year and uh, kind of as a cyclic maintenance measure. measure. Um, and the other um, item that I would say is that you can um, end up doing, you can fully reglaze. Um, so take all of the glazing out and then reglaze um, and then redo that component. If you have broken glass, you can do that. Um, or you can do a completely refurbish of your windows. So that's taking the wood down to bare wood, no finishes, um, and uh, basically to kind of do a fully refurbish. Um, and so I'm rambling a little bit, but what I'm trying to say is that you can do a full restoration and that might include having to do wood repairs and reconstruction, it might not. Um, you can refinish one side of your window, you would not refinish the other side. Um, I think the, when determining your level of restoration, you also need to kind of know your materials and know your limits. And so um, your materials are, you know, wood, you might have different types of paint. So you could have lead paint on there. Um, it could not be, it could just be a regular oil paint or acrylic. Um, but what's important about knowing that is that if you're a high risk person where, you know, you're worried about having lead exposure or you have kids and you're worried about bringing that home and you're not sure about safety practices, then perhaps then, you know, doing paint removal is something you need to talk to a different professional about. Um, and other things like knowing where to source different materials and hardware and nails, you know, glazing and everything like that. Um, it's thinking about, do I know where to get these things? And hopefully we'll send out a document. I've tried to link a lot of the different things that I use when I do window restoration. Um, but also knowing your limits. So like I said, hazardous materials. Do you know if there's lead? Do you know if you feel comfortable working around uh, mater hazardous materials like lead? Um, and it's also thinking about the safety in the terms of locating where your windows are. Are they on the second floor and do you feel comfortable up on ladders, you know, removing storm windows or removing a, you know, the sash from the inside, um, but, you know, maybe having to go on a ladder to cut the paint that um, painted the window shut. Um, and then also thinking about, you know, what can you learn? you know, and also time and efficiency. So when is it the correct time to go see a professional? And that's gonna be different for everybody else. I like to say that most things beyond a little bit more of the finicky woodworking component, most homeowners can do themselves. I am so confident that everybody can learn how to glaze a window, how to repaint a window, how to scrape a window, um, and do basic um, epoxy and wood rot repair. Um, those are all things that I believe that um, homeowners can do uh, to maintain their home and, and learn over time. Okay, so with that, I do want to cover a few window myths because they always come up and I'd like to address them right away. Um, and the first one is about sustainability. And so there's this idea that has been perpetuated um, by different markets that um, wood windows are not sustainable. And I would argue that is, it is very false based on a number of different um, articles and publication and research that has come out of um, a prominent um, uh, restoration and preservation um, uh, um, research places like the National Center for Preservation Technology and other um, prominent um, organizations. Um, and so what they have actually found is that new windows, vinyl windows or otherwise, are not necessarily um, going to 
give you the energy efficiency benefits that you might think. Um, because often what you find if you have a working window system, and this includes a couple of things, it means you have a working storm window and a working interior window, or um, kind of other forms of traditional weatherization techniques, um, like weather stripping, bronze weather stripping. Um, and when you have a working old wood window system, that system works just as well as these newer um, windows. And in terms of sustainability, in terms of cost, by maintaining and restoring your wood windows, those windows, based on the materials, because often they're used with old growth wood or they're well constructed, um, will last much longer than often new vinyl windows or other ones that will be inserted into your home. Um, and there's this also the idea, and this is primarily because those new windows will have to be replaced. So once the, um, the insulating property, so that you know the uh, seal is broken, water is getting in between those panes of glass, that window can't be repaired. Those windows are not repairable, but old wood windows and, and windows like it um, are always going to be repairable and maintainable. I think often it's a little bit, um, overwhelming when you see a large project or your windows might be very deteriorated. However, once you get those windows back up into workable and operable, um, the maintenance of them do not have to be complicated or overwhelming. It's learning how to do that maintenance every year and from that point on you're going to be able to um, maintain those windows relatively easily. Um, and you're going to end up spending a lot less money over time. You're not buying new windows every 10 to 20 years based on the lifespan of the, of the windows. Um, and I think the other thing I want to mention about saving your wood windows is that it also has to do with the character of your home. And often, you know, I know when I'm heading into the depths of winter, I love the beautiful light that comes in in my wood windows. And depending on the inserts or type of windows you go with, you're going to find that you lose light because some inserts will actually make the window opening smaller. And also looking from the outside exterior of a historic home, depending on um, when it was built, uh, just the fenestration, the way the windows look, and this is some of the character defining features of your home. And so maintaining the, the beauty and the character of your home often is within, you know, maintaining your windows. Um, and my final thing about um, sustain, uh, about energy efficiency is most of the time, the most energy is lost through walls that are not properly insulated as well as uninsulated attics. It's not actually through windows um, as well as long as the windows are properly maintained and everything. Um, so I think I'm going to end there because I, I could probably go on a little bit more and um, hopefully in the document we'll send you. Um, I will also link more about sustainability and window myths so you can read more about it. So this is my at least take on the basics of the window restoration process. Um, and so the first is, uh, the first and second to me are a little bit in tandem. Um, you're going to do a, an assessment, so kind of gauge what's going on with your window that you can see before taking it out. But also once you take that window out, you wanna kind of assess what's wrong with it and um, kind of what the different issues are. Um, you know, say I'm looking at this window uh, in, on the slide, which shows that it's missing a sash cord. It also shows like the, the rails are a little bit uneven. And so kind of noting those different things of how the window is performing in place without having been extracted at all. And extraction, what I mean by extraction is taking those two window sash out to be worked on. Um, and that takes a little bit of process. Often I would say it takes tools that are often in your toolkit already. Um, and some are gonna be easier than others to do. And we'll talk a, a little bit about um, those different techniques and we'll go over video. Um, paint and glaze removal, um, that's what I get questions about a lot. I end up using, um, I've used a couple different methods, but for homeowners, what I often recommend is um, using the, a heat gun um, and also um, and a heat gun and scrapers to remove those things. Um, it's sometimes like a slow process, but once you kind of get the hang of things, everybody finds their own groove um, to do that type of removal. I'm going to talk particularly about glass cleaning because it's something that gets skipped over a lot. Um, and I just have a couple of tips for you on that. Um, 
The next section that I would talk about, uh, the next kind of part of the process is wood repair, which includes rot, it, re it could include replacement and conditioning. Um, so rot obviously, um, dealing with rot and any other degradation. Um, replacement, so if you need to do any replacement of those wood um, components, but also conditioning. So your wood might have relatively good integrity, but be very dry and be very brittle. And so there are ways to condition it and bring it back to life so that it'll last longer and also be less susceptible to rot and other degradation issues. Um, then once you have that and you have your beautiful wood components sitting there, um, we, and also clean glass, then you can start your glazing process. And there are little tri tricks and techniques that we'll talk about today and also how to prepare your, um, the area, the rabbit, which is where the glass sits in the window. Um, or I guess the glazing bed is also another term for it. Um, little tips and tricks for how to, um, glaze those well, and also prepare the wood properly so your glaze will last longer. Um, once that is all nicely finished, then you will get on to your painting and finishing. And so you might use paint, you might use shellac, you might use a lacquer. And so we'll talk a little bit about different options and different types of paint. And finally, you can have like a mechanical um, restoration. So that's including, you know, am I missing a sash weight? Am I missing my sash cord? How are my sash locks and other kind of like um, um, different um, hardware components? Um, and then finally, once you have all these different parts like uh, figured out and working together, then we can do reinstallation, which is really just the reverse of extraction. Um, so today we don't have time to do everything, although I wish we did. Um, however, I've inserted a few videos during this presentation just so you all can see the process and ask me questions if anything of that is confusing. Um, it's drawn from one of my favorite kind of online sources, which is the Craftsman blog. Um, uh, Scott uh, Seidler, I really hope I got his last name right, um, is a window restorationist in Florida, but he also uh, does other wood, uh, old home restoration. He has a great kind of video about extracting windows and kind of different parts. I've broken it up into different sections so you can see um, these different components. Um, besides that, I will demonstrate some of the other um, skills and uh, methods myself, and we can talk about it. Uh, but before we do that, we'll have to transition to the other uh, area. Um, I'm going to show you uh, just the window extraction video um, before we do our transition. Um, you all can ask me questions, and then we'll move on to um, the, um, the live demonstration and everything. Um, and then after that point, I do have a couple more videos I would like to show you, um, depending on time. Um, but otherwise, I will, I'll make sure that those links are embedded so you can see those as well. But I um, want to make sure we get to that live demonstration so you see some of those um, techniques. Anyways, before we get on to the video, um, are there any questions or concerns or uh, uh, things that I can answer? Oh, cool. I will figure out how I get back to the chat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Um, so now told me that the question is, can you source old growth materials or old growth wood for repairs? The answer is yes. And so because there is such a massive market for replacement windows, uh, there are a lot of old wood windows floating around these days. And so I would often say there is a number of different salvage places that you can go to. I know that a window restorationist in the city, uh, Joe Hayes, who is phenomenal, um, has also taught classes for Rethos, um, had a neighbor down the way who replaces windows and Joe was like, hey, can I, uh, can I take your windows? And so he now has, you know, a stock of different old wood windows that he uses to make repairs. Um, it's uh, really sad, but you can find those materials um, and try to match them to the ones that you already have. Um, besides that, there are some places um, where you can buy old growth wood that's not finished, um, but it's very expensive and it's sometimes hard to find unless you're in a kind of a specialty location. Um, so often what I try to do is find uh, materials that are, you know, 
in cellar shops, which are old wood windows or doors, things that I can find, you know, large pieces from. Um, and uh, finding pieces also that might match and make for an easier repair. Um, so I guess that would be my suggestion. If you're looking for old growth wood, um, look for wood windows that are taken out of other homes. Um, you might find wood windows that are even taken out um, from homes that are in your area and therefore might have a similar integrity and time period. I hope that answers that question. Um, okay found my chat button again, so. Okay, so is there anything else that I can answer before we watch this first video? Okay, well, we're gonna be on to this first, this first video and um, if you have, we're gonna just discuss that video a little bit afterwards because I have a few notes about it. So, this. And please let me and give me a shout out if you for some reason are having issues with the video and I'll I will just send you all a link. The first thing you're going to want to do is score the paint line on the interior stops. You got to do this so the paint doesn't strip off of all the rest of the trim when you pull these stops off and then using a good firm five and one putty knife or even a trim pry bar which I'll use here in a second is a good way to get these stops right off the wall. I'm showing most of this in uh, one basic tape with minimal cuts so that you can see the whole process. It's not super fast but uh, it gives you a sense of how long things can take. You want to be extra careful with those stops so they don't break off or you'll end up buying some new ones or milling some new ones if they're specialty designs, which sometimes they are, especially on older houses. Now there's a stop on each side and one on the top that needs to come off too. Once you've got them all pried off, I sometimes will label them so I know exactly where they go. And uh, once that's finished, you're ready to move on to the next step. For now, just listen to some cool music and watch me work. to get the bottom sash out. Oftentimes the bottom sash can come out really easy depending on your window, but in this case it was pretty painted shut, so this is kind of a worst case scenario. Using a 5-in-1, I'll shoot that down between the brake and the meeting rail between the top and bottom sash, and then I can usually pivot the top out a bit, and then you've got to work it to get it up above the stool there, what most people call a window sill, but it's really the stool. Once you get it over that, take it down there and take the ropes off. Somebody had decided to attach these ropes with a screw, so we remove that, but oftentimes it's just a nail or nothing at all. Moving on to the top sash, it's a little bit more difficult. You've got to get the parting bead out, which is sometimes nailed in place and sometimes just press fit in place into a little channel. I like these duckbill vice grips. Uh, a welder's tool, but they work great. You can tighten it however much you need to get a good grip on that parting bead and get it out, but you have to work it around the meeting rail on the top sash. It's real tight in there, and it has a lot of paint on the interior and exterior of this one, so there's a lot of cutting to do, a lot of using a five-in-one to pry this sash free before we were able to get the parting bead out. But before that top sash can go anywhere, you're gonna have to get the parting bead out. And sometimes like that it breaks, but that's okay. Parting bead is just a simple rectangular piece of wood. You can find it or make it yourself. It's not too hard to replace and actually in most of my window restoration jobs we end up replacing all the parting bead anyway.
and this one had just one nail in it. Put that aside, and then you do the other side. Sometimes you got to talk to the homeowner too when they ask questions. So now I come around here, I'm going to want to paint, uh, cut the paint line on the outside of the window sash. This one was really painted and cocked shut. It's uh, about a 120 year old window, so had a lot of angry painters. Keep cutting it free, you just got to keep getting it to move. Now there's a pulley up top, so it won't pull out like the top sash did until it gets below that pulley. So you just keep jimmying it, shaking it. Sometimes I find a five-in-one like this going in between the parting bead and the top sash you can help pry it down. Just keep doing that a few times in a few places. Eventually it will work itself down. And sometimes it's the paint line on the very top of the sash that's still holding it in place. Once it's below the pulley, should be able to pull it in and remove the ropes the same way as the bottom set. Okay, so I hope that worked well for everyone. Oh! We're going to not watch that a second time. So sorry. The first thing you're going to want to do. Ah, okay. So, um, the reason I wanted to show that to you all is that this gives a really good sense of how to take these windows out. And because we're working on storm windows today, uh, we weren't necessarily showing you the extraction process. Um, so um, I did have a couple of comments I wanted to say, um, just things that I would do a little differently than he might. Um, and I think every window restorationist has their own methods. On um, the first part is he talked about the parting bead um, and the way he took out this particular window um, was trying to work that parting bead out uh, with that top sash all the way at the top of that casing. And what I, I find that is much easier than doing that um, is that doing that process where he cuts the paint and gets that top sash to move downwards first. Um, so if it's possible. Um, the purpose of this is that once you get that, that um, top sash to go mostly to the bottom is that you can kind of remove and deal with any nails or any other issues and working it around at the bottom. It's just a tiny piece of the bottom versus trying to get it to bend in the middle of that wood parting bead piece. Um, sometimes will mean that if the parting bead itself is, has a lot of paint on it, you might need to scrape that paint off the backside. Um, and maybe kind of uh, scrape some of the paint off of the jams, which are the inside part where the window slides. Um, I say it's almost, it's to me almost always worth it to go through that process, mostly because saving that parting bead, it's been cut and fit and it fits in that spot. And so I often try to save the parting beads and he says he replaces them. He probably has a workshop that is much more able to handle it. Um, there are places in the Twin Cities where you can buy kind of different sizes of parting bead. Um, but I often try to save them because they're original with the house, because they're often good material um, and everything like that. Um, and I think another note I wanted to say is that you don't kind of see him using these different um, methods and, um, and everything, but just another, just another quick note about lead paint um, is that during this process, uh, depending on your window, it can be very dusty. And so in general, you might want to wear a dust mask or a respirator or something like that. If you don't know if you have blood or not, um, you can often buy a lead test online if you do want to um, attempt to uh, figure out if you have lead or it hasn't be often you can get people to come in and do lead tests um, for safety in your home. Um, uh, one way to keep that dust down is that 
by having a HEPA vacuum nearby or a shop vac or something to filter out and like capture that dust as you go is often very helpful so instead of just building up and it kind of going everywhere you you vacuum it up as you go. Um, also another really great way to do this is you just have a small like squirt bottle or a spray bottle and you wet down the wood and area so that keeps the dust down. If it's wet it's not flying up in the air you're not breathing it breathing it in and that's primarily the way people will have issues with lead and like in it's people always think about like ingesting lead because kids will like eat things but um for adults it'll either be through inhalate it'll often be through inhalation of small particles of dust over time um so i just wanted to make those two points because he's working on a window and um it doesn't look to be it hopefully is not lead paint um but those are a couple of safety precautions um i would always take if working potentially on a window with lead on it um and so I just also want to talk a little bit about the different um, tools and things he used. And so I've started creating a list of these different items. Um, but I always find it really useful to have a number of different types of screwdrivers or make sure you check and see what type of screws you might have. So the parting be or the stops he's taking out and you can kind of see in the video right now. Um, they don't have any screws in them, but often what you'll sometimes see. I wonder if I can show you this. I can go back in the presentation, maybe. Um, so in this vid in this picture, you can see this little dot that kind of is in the middle of this stop in the windows here. And that is a little screw and washer. And the purpose of those often is to just, oh, this is gonna, okay. So the purpose of those is to um, make it easier to take those stops off. So you just unscrew them and pop them out they're in my parents' home and I've seen a lot of other places. You can also add those to your stops so it makes it easier the next time to take your stops out instead of nailing them back in. So what he's having to deal with is that they've been nailed in and so he has to gently pry those um, stops off. Um, and the one other thing that he doesn't, there's a couple of tools that I actually, or a few different tools that I find particularly useful when removing windows, especially if they're very stuck. The first is a bent pole scraper and so, it's kind of like a putty knife, but just like beefed up in some ways. Um, and so it's just like a much thicker metal, but you can insert it between the sash and stops and are able to kind of do like a little wiggle, a little shimmy, um, but get a little bit more leverage because it's a stiffer um, uh, tool. Um, the, the other one is called a window zipper, a deglazing tool, um, which looks a little funky and I can show you it later. Um, but what it does is you can run it along um, places where uh, two pieces of wood have been painted together or there's like a, a film over it. And, um, and basically, uh, doo -doo -doo. oh, I, yes, uh, so the prying tool, uh, a bent pole scraper, also, I've been compelling, you should, we'll send you out a long list of tools that I often use. Um, and so you will get that. So, and I've linked everything, but like, uh, I have the tools I like, but they have a lot of generic ones. Um, and so another tool that I, uh, and so the other one he uses that's particularly good is the, um, it's called a locking pliers or a sheet metal tool. And so that is that flat build tool he uses to wiggle out the parting bead. This is one that I would say, if you're doing restoration, if you're taking your windows out, you need this to remove your parting bead. Just you're unable to grip it properly without damaging the wood. Um, and this tool just makes it 10 billion times easier. Um, also we'll include that on the list of different tools. Um, and the, the other one that I will say that um, um, is also very useful um, is that um, there's like these little like stainless steel pry bars and they have, um, they're kind of, I. I will make sure I'll show you these in the live demo too. Um, but it's basically kind of just like an L shaped, but it's the very flat part of um, kind of on the L. And what you can do is actually insert that from behind the stop. So he was prying from the front side of the um, of the stop, but you can actually insert it behind and pop it off that way. And that way, if you mar the wood or have anything else, it's actually not visible. Um, and so that's, um, I don't know, I think they're just called, there's like steel pry bar. They're just like these little um, pry bars. Um, they're just extremely useful. Um, 
Yes, I think that's all the ones I'm going to mention for now. Um, but I, there will be a list coming out with all these different tools linked to, to different places. Um, so I think those are all my little um, necessary notes. I just wanted to add to that video, but I also wanted to open it up for more questions. Um, so just things that popped up while you watched the video and things that were might be confusing. Oh, I do see there is um, another question about, do you know what species of wood were commonly used for wood uh, windows in the past? And I would, I would often say just it would be pine. Um, that's one of the ones that is, I see, I think probably the most often. Um, you can sometimes see maple, sometimes see oak, but um, I think I've mostly worked with, with pine, um, pine wood. Anyways, thought dropped off there. But, um, but yeah, but I think just depending on the area you're in too, when I was working in California, there was my, the majority of the wood windows that I worked on were old growth redwood. And so we have to source redwood to replace in kind because we were working on um, federal buildings. And so we'd have to get redwood to use on these buildings. And so um, it often is depending on locality. So you could do a little research and see kind of what different um, species of uh, wood existed in your area or where different wood came from in that region. Um, yeah. Our wood, no wood is very hard. What type might it be? We live in Good Thunder, just a few miles south of Mankato. So I probably won't be able to tell you what type it is. I mean, pine can be relatively hard um, if it is old growth and it, if it is like, um, has been pretty well maintained. It can be very hard, um, but without seeing the wood grain um, and being able to do some of that identification, I probably can't help you. And I, but I, yeah, and I also don't know where wood was sourced well enough to know um, if Good Thunder was sourcing it from similar places as Minneapolis as well. So I'm sorry, I can't answer that one quite as well. Were there any questions about the extraction process or any confusion about kind of different techniques? Well, if you all think of some, I think we're going to take this moment to um, do our transition over into our makeshift workshop. Um, Natalie, how much time do you think we need? Like 10 minutes, 15? Um, so we're going to come back in 15 minutes um, just to make sure we can get our, the camera set up so you all can see everything properly. Um, so around, um, I guess by my time, on here um, at 10.15, uh, you can kind of make your way back and we'll start this next demonstration. Um, but yeah, if you have more questions, pop them in the chat um, or ask me when we get back to things. So I will see you all soon.
Ready and ready to go. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started one more time here. Um, quick tip, uh, because Laura will be demonstrating, um, I suggest switching to speaker view, which means that when she's speaking, um, the this our, our little rectangle will fill up your screen. You can also um, click the three dots in the top right hand corner of my video and um, click pin video. And that same thing will happen. Um, our screen will fill up your screen. So um, that's the best way and hopefully you get the best um, view of what's going on. Please do uh, comment in the chat if you have any questions or have issues hearing or seeing or anything. Um, and we'll get started here. So. I take this off? Is that it? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. You can see everything all right. If not, um, we'll kind of make different adjustments. But the I did want to show you a few items I said I would show you. So um, the first are when I was talking about that little, like, almost like the trim puller and everything. Um, so this is a little tool. Let me figure out how to, uh, this is a tool that I was talking about. And so if we imagine for just a second so if we imagine ah, so if we imagine like this is our trim piece and everything and this is like flat so what you can do is instead of coming from this side you come from the back and you can pull it up from the back side that way you're not going to mess up this side which is often would be the side where you would see um, on the outside um, and I have a couple of different ones that are useful. I have this kind of larger, larger option. And then I have this smaller kind of one right here, uh, just depending on the different uh, stop sizes and trim sizes and everything. Um, but they're just extremely useful little tools. Um, when I talked about that um, other kind of stiffer item, I was, hopefully you can hear me, um, so I was talking about um, this one, which is like kind of like a pole scraper, but the kind of purpose of it, the angle piece helps with kind of getting up and being able to pry kind of in different directions. Um, I just have the pretty one and everything. There's a ton of different brands out there. Um, um, so that's the one I was talking about. Um, and when I was talking about the window zipper, the really odd kind of specialty tool, this is what I'm talking about. The blade of it is very, very thin. And so that means when you're trying to um, break the seal on uh, between two pieces of wood where it's been painted over, you can do that very gently, um, a little bit more easily than maybe just cracking it or scoring it. Um, these are the vice grips that were uh, mentioned in the video. So these are ones that I think are particularly useful when doing parting bead removal, just because that flat bill will grip easily and allow you to kind of wiggle it easy, um, more easily outwards. Um, and I finally remember the other weird and specialty tool that I find very useful, um, which is a magnet on an extender. And I'll come back to this later about why this is actually relatively important, and that's for the uh, mechanical restoration and um, uh, reinstallation uh, section. Um, so for the live demonstration, I did want to talk a little bit about how to do kind of a window assessment and really understanding um, what you have and what you're working with. Um, um, so the first thing, generally what I try to do is, so we have our window out and what I'm trying to look at is a few different components in windows. So I often look at the integrity of the wood. I look for the integrity of the glazing putty um, and then also the integrity of the glass. So I'm just looking at these kind of different elements um, as well as the finish. Um, and so in this case, um, you can kind of see a little bit hopefully um, is that you have, I have little bits of glazing that are already coming out. And in these two other sections are two pieces of glass that actually fully kind of fell out of it. Um, part of, partly, I mean, uh, just because of the rot that's at the end jams. And I'm gonna see if I can show you this. Let's see if I can be effective. Um, 
So I'm going to move you slowly. Is it right? Yep. Okay, so hopefully you can see this, and I'm not wiggling too much. But the ends of these. Oh, a little farther back. Oh, how's that? Um, so the ends of these, these are what I would call the side rails. So the ends of it on both sides are very warped and or completely degraded and de gone. Um, and then the other piece on the bottom is this. Um, so this bottom rail, so it's on the bottom of the window, um, which also is significant rot damage and had what the significant water damage. This is the piece that had the nice fruiting body of the fungi um, growing out of it. So bring you back to this other little area over here, hopefully, maybe. Um, so we have a number of different things going on. I think the one thing we can kind of mark off our list is, um, is the fact that all of our glass is actually intact. We don't have any broken panes of glass. This is particularly nice because with these rounded windows, cutting rounded windows is more difficult. Um, if you're a beginner to cutting glass and everything, I would highly recommend maybe going to a hardware shop or seeking out a professional who might have better capabilities. Um, I knew one master craftsman who was able to cut a heart out of glass, and I still to this day have no idea how. Um, and so kind of on to the next um, item is I look at the finish. And so if you can kind of see, do, do, do. I'm gonna push this down, oh, thanks. Um, so you can kind of see a little bit this kind of difference in color along these different edges. And the critical point is, is it's showing that the finish, the paint on this is actually like um, wearing out almost completely in different areas and spots. Um, and what's critical about this is that the finish of wood is actually extremely important to maintain its integrity, um, both for ultraviolet uh, radiation, which will degrade the wood over time if it's not finished, but also water will now be able to penetrate into this, um, into this wood because it has no finish. Besides that, um, you can see that the paint is no longer sealed between the wood and the glazing. And so this might not seem, you might be like, oh, my glazing, it's not popping out, like it's fine. The problem with it is that because there is no seal here anymore, water now can go in between these and rest there and it has no way to escape from that. Or it's going to get into the glazing bed, which is these, it's like kind of like a little L and that's where the glass will sit um, and start to rot that out because it'll just sink into that wood if it's unprotected. So. To kind of recap, our, gla our glass is all good. We want to try to save that if possible. And when we're removing this, I hope to God it doesn't break, but it has, I've had different pieces of glass break, but try our best to always maintain our glass. Um, and then our finish is obviously wearing away. Um, the finish that's on it right now is extremely thin. And so if we're in doing a full kind of refinish, um, it'd be highly suggested to do a, um, conditioning of the wood, doing a, a really good primer, and um, having a really good top coat so we have a full kind of paint system instead of having just a very thin coat, which kind of it appears to be, because that doesn't last quite as long. Um, so in terms of wood integrity, you saw a little bit at the bottom there about how degraded that was, and it goes to show that those bottom parts of the window, those lower elements, are often the ones that are most degraded and the ones that see the most significant rot. Um, these upper components, when I'm kind of feeling around, I'm kind of doing a visual assessment, I see a little water damage on the top, but not a lot, um, but it's something you kind of be note, note and everything. Um, but no significant rot damage. Um, when I look at these glazing beds where um, different pieces of glass out, those glazing beds seem to be intact. And so from maybe about, um, oh no, kind of the, mm, depending, it's probably the bottom eight inches of the side rails and that lower rail that are the most significant wood damage. Um, the glazing itself actually looks like it could be relatively new. I don't know what type of paint it is or type of glazing putty it is, um, but it has been popping out relatively easily. Um, and we'll 
talk a little bit about making choices for your materials and everything. Because um, <clears throat> I have personal preferences about what type of blazing putty I use, but it also depends on where you are, what your level is, how much you want to spend on um, different materials. Um, the other little item I did want to talk about when doing assessments with wood, especially, is um, when you're working on wood elements and where you're doing these repairs, you don't want your wood to still be wet. And so if it's really moist, has rot, you want to bring that window into a place where it can dry out fully before doing any of these repairs. Um, and so if I'm kind of, it's on the cusp, I'm not quite sure, is it dry, is it not, how's it going? I actually have a, a little moisture meter. It's not the best moisture meter, it's not the worst moisture meter, but um, it just at least gives you um, at least a little bit of an idea of what your moisture content is. You can do this step and you can, when your wood is in place and you're seeing it's rotted or if it's moist, you can go through and check your wood and see if it's having um, a lot of moisture issues. So if it's reading above 12%, consistently, you know that you're now in the range, the danger range for rot and other uh, degradation, insect infestation and otherwise. So, so this is a useful little tool. Um, this one has little pins, which potentially you can maybe see. What are they, what did Instagrammers do? Do they put like their hand? There, see the little <laughs> pins. Um, but these are ones that you can insert into the wood. Um, they also make ones that are pinless, and those you put against it, and it still um, will take a reading. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's a little comment about that. So whenever I'm doing an assessment, I like to um, make sure that I'm taking notes. I have notes in a different journal, so I'm not going to sit here and write down all these notes again. Um, but I like to keep documentation of what's going on with the materials I'm working with. And because I'm doing that, I'm going to be able to document what process I took and also potentially where I went wrong or things could have been done better or, you know, what materials I used, what paint I used, you know, so that the next time I'm not like, I have no idea where to start again. You have a starting basis. Um, I also like to think about, um, you know, maintaining um, a journal or a house like um, work notebook just to make sure that you're keeping track of different issues your house might be seeing so you know hey next year i need to take care of this water issue or hey i noticed my siding seems really moist this year which seems different um because you can look back on notes and if you're seeing that consistently you can start to see patterns and you can start to understand better um kind of what your home has issues with um we talked a little bit about some of this in the last class with the conditions class and everything, which is pretty in depth, but um, you could even have a notebook, anything, a little file folder where you keep things. Um, and so I think the next thing you do once you have this information about doing kind of a conditions assessment of your window is then you need to decide what the most critical elements are. So say most of my window was like this upper half, the wood is sound, Maybe we have some degradation of the paint. Maybe, you know, I'm noticing that this blazing isn't so great. It's kind of mostly falling out. So in that case, what you need to do is kind of this next part, which I'm gonna show you, is you might want to uh, um, remove the glazing, redo it completely, you know, clean the glass off, kind of do a refurbish. Or say your glazing is perfectly fine. Say you're just missing these little pieces. And in that case, if these are really solid, then what you can actually do is something called spot glazing. Um, and we'll go over that in the glazing section. But, um, but really this is going down to a level of assessing what level of restoration you need to do. So for this window, it's really gonna need an overhaul. So it needs to be refinished. The glazing seems okay, except for it's tending to fail right where it meets the wood, which tells me it's not bonding properly. Um, and it obviously needs rot repair and um, potentially wood replacement, eventually. Um, then I'm gonna take you through a few different ways that I approach this. Um, you know, in the assessment, it really does seem like this was refinished at some point, so I'm not worried about lead. This paint just seems like just a, like an oil finish, and this um, putty seems relatively new. Um, 
I'd like to just add that sometimes be careful with putty. Um, I, I don't think it's super frequent that this happens, but some putty, depending on what area you're in, and I just would need to chuck it from Minnesota, can have asbestos in it. And so it's just being mindful and maybe putting your mask on or a dust mask or something else. Um, so talking about PPE, because we're going to go into a demonstration of glazing and paint removal. Um, so when I use the PPE that I use, um, is a couple different things. Um, so when I know I'm working with lead, I will often use a, a respirator. Like oh, so, and they, these are going to be the P100s. Um, the ones that are really going <clears> to <throat> keep you from getting that dust into your lungs. Um, they also make ones that are good. Um, also think about. Um, uh, just other ways of inhalation. So make sure that if you're even just using a regular mask and everything, that it's going to be keeping that dust kind of um, away from your lungs. Um, besides that, I have sensitive ears, maybe you all do too, but um, when I use the have a vacuum, I like to use um, Ear Pro, um, honestly. As I'm somebody who's played music for a long time, I'm trying to protect them more than I did when I sat right in front of the percussion for like 10 years. Um, and then finally, because I'm using heat, I like to wear gloves, but do not wear plastic gloves while using heat. That is a terrible idea. So these are more just like cloth gloves. I say that because I've seen people adhere plastic gloves to themselves, which is not great. Um, and so that's the, 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 the um, personal protective equipment. That's what PPE stands for in case you have issues with um, or if, in case you uh, don't know what PPE stands for, uh, as so a prote personal protective equipment. Um, and finally, um, sometimes like when you're working on this, like you might like fling little pieces of glazing and everything. And so often I will just toss on a pair of eye pro and everything. Don't just use any eye protection because um, you want to, yeah, Z87 or other ones are actually rated to protect your eyes from uh, damage using, um, I've had, People that I've worked with in the field shatter their regular sunglasses uh, because they're using them as their protective equipment and it just is not the same. Um, so kind of look for your different materials. Um, so I'm going to not put my mask on right now um, once we maybe do a little scraping, um, but the method that I'm using is particular to keep dust down um, and to often I use when I know there's lead, but also when I'm just trying not to make a mess. Um, so this setup that I have, this is um, the Pro Scraper, this yellow beauty. It is beautiful, it's lovely. Um, and why I love it, I mean, it just scrapes really well. Um, you can flip the carbide, uh, uh, carbide uh, blade here and you have twice the length of um, use. Um, and what it actually is, is it's attached to a HEPA vacuum. And these are all materials uh, that are going on this kind of reference sheet that you will receive. Um, this setup was actually developed by Greg Rose now, who is also a Rethos instructor, but also a, you know, a phenomenal um, window restorationist um, in the cities. Um, but this way, every time I scrape, that dust is going to go straight into the vacuum and not into your home or anywhere else. Um, and really does keep the dust down a lot. It often means that using this method, I can um, scrape without, um, if using just a regular dust mask or something like that. If I'm in a place where I can't really use the HEPA vacuum or the scraper, then I'll often put my mask on. Um, scrape with a different tool, um, one of my favorites, which is this kind of soft grip orange scraper, um, and then suck up the debris kind of as I go. Um, so another tool that we're going to see in this is, um, I use a Wagner, um, heat gun. There's a lot of different brands and types. Um, I'll put, a, include a link for that too. The reason I like this particular one is it comes with these little sets, uh, or little, um, attachments. And so if you come on and off, there's a couple of different like varieties. This one is the one I use when I'm working on glazing or other materials. And that is because when you're working with glazing, when you're working with this, you want to protect your glass because half the way people break their glass is when they're using a heat gun 
but not protecting it. So if this is off, I'm shooting this at it. I am not now not only heating the glazing and the paint, I'm now heating the glass, which can cause it to crack and break, especially if there's like a glazing plate, which are the little metal pieces that hold the glass in to this spot. Um, once you heat that little metal piece up really, really hot, then that piece of glass gets really, really hot and will can crack it straight across. Um, other methods, so if you didn't wanna buy the one with the attachments, that's totally fine because the other method that I have often used is that you take a little piece of step flashing, which you can see I put a little tape on because I like to protect the glass as much as possible from any scratches and scrapes. Um, but this little piece of metal, instead of having to use the protective um, item on this, you can put this here. And then when you shoot this, it'll kind of reflect back onto the glazing and the wood instead. Um, so I like to use both. Um, and it really just kind of depends. Sometimes I don't want to mess with this little attachment, so I'll use this and kind of move it along. Sometimes this is just nice because then you, you're moving along pretty easily. Okay, so I think that is the majority of things I'm going to say before actually showing you how to do this. Yes, that is yes. Okay, the, the short answer is yes. Um, often why I don't put this on my materials list is because they can be rather expensive, but if you have the budget to um, accommodate doing an infrared heater, um, they work phenomenally well. And part of that is that using an infrared heater, um, you can mitigate the chance of vaporizing lead if it exists. Um, and so you can get a heat gun like mine, which you can actually see the temperature because lead paint and lead has a vaporization point. And so you need to be careful about that fumes don't start to happen. And so you don't wanna always crank this up like super, super high. And that's also why getting a mask too that may have vapor protection can be useful. Um, there's different types of uh, infrared heaters. So there's long ones. And that way you can actually set it kind of along. Similar though, you need to protect your glass from that heat, um, but you can just work it along and do long sections at a time. This is only gonna heat very little sections at a time, although it is effective. The most effective infrared heater that I know about is called the Cobra. And it's very, which sounds very cool, but you know, it really is, it works phenomenally well. I think it took glazing out the fastest I've seen any um, infrared heater. Um, it's also, it's also to me at least extremely expensive. And when you're doing this yourself, I often think uh, a, a heater like this can work okay. Um, so I think the only other thing I wanted to add is that when taking out glazing and everything like that, um, there's also a steam heating method, which can be particularly useful for the glazing. However, it's really, if you decide to go with that method, you need to be careful about the, your wood can soak in that moisture. And so you need to be aware of that because if you start scraping that wet wood in a wrong direction, you can actually cause kind of fraying and tearing of your wood and kind of cause more harm to it. So it can be good for glazing, but then you need to let that wood dry out before kind of doing some of that other work. Okay, so long explanation, but um, from here, what I'm gonna do, and you can kind of see me already doing this because I can't help myself, which is starting to pick out like little pieces of glazing that can just come out easily. Um, and so you saw in the video, um, Scott was using a uh, kind of like a painter's tool, 51601, I think it's been called different things, kind of this funny little shape. But this is one of my favorite tools to go around and just check to see if I can like remove any of these little pieces. Um, the key point here is if it doesn't want to come out, it doesn't want to come out. Um, never force, never pry on the glass. You never want to like, pry it and use leverage to get it out. What you want to see is if it just kind of comes out relatively easily. Um, this method is where you start kind of figuring out how to spot glaze as well. And so when you're going around, you're just trying to pick out the pieces that easily are removed. You don't want to pry super hard putty out. This stuff is coming out rather easily. I think it's a newer putty, but some older putty, oh goodness, it is like, it feels like cement. And that's the stuff that you don't want to pry off because what you can do is what you also run the risk of damaging your glass or your wood. I have seen chunks of glazing 
rip small parts of wood out from the glazing bed. And so I think the key to most window restoration parts of this process is patience is everything. And you want to wiggle it just a little and gently kind of um, approach the, um, the project. If you get frustrated, I would always recommend to just step away for a minute, go drink a Diet Coke or have some tea, find your Zen again and then come back to it. Um, brushing these process, like any parts of this process is just never a great thing. Um, so take your time, find your like glaze removing Zen and kind of approach it from there. So I'm gonna go around and kind of just see what comes out. So not. Okay. And so a lot of this seems relatively stable, besides the fact that um, some of this is separating from the wood elements and everything. So, but I think this will offer us kind of a good opportunity to see how to um, kind of remove some of this glazing. Um, so, this glazing may be a little bit easier to take out. It might be more difficult. But one thing I'd always say is you can work incrementally. So I'm going to show you now how to like heat the glazing putty because you can take that glazing putty down layer by layer um, and kind of like shave away the little pieces of, can I see the best way to like show you some of this? But um, the glazing, you can kind of work it down piece by piece. And so we're going to take all, work on taking the majority of this glazing out, primarily because I want to be able to show you how to reglaze this and uh, see that whole process. So I'm going to put my gloves on um, and things might get noisy just for a second because I'm going to turn my heat gun on. Um, because of that, um, I will answer, either Natalie can yell questions at me and I can try to answer or I can answer them after I do a little bit of, of work on this. So. And right now I'm just adjusting my heat. Um, and you can adjust, at least in this one, you can adjust the uh, speed of the fan and the, the amount of heat that it's going to be using. So, so generally this, this heat gun heats up relatively quickly. Some take a little bit longer. Um, infrared heaters can take a little bit longer just to kind of get to an adjustment point. The Cobra just works always. I try not to rest immediately on the glass when I do this. Um, just again, to kind of mitigate any chances of involuntarily breaking glass. What I'm kind of looking for when I'm heating this up is that you can see a couple different things happen sometimes with paint. If you have layers and layers of paint, you can often see that paint bubble and the film kind of starting to, to come up. And that's when you know you kind of reach a pretty decent point. Glazing is a little harder. And also because the paint on this is so thin, we may not quite see that quite as much. Different glazing, you might need to do like a little bit more, a little bit less. So what you can kind of see here is that I was able to kind of get this first layer to kind of separate. Always be rather careful when kind of doing this. I'm breaking the seal of paint on the glass. And the one thing to mention is that um, it's sometimes easy to gouge the wood when you do this. And so be very careful on this edge to not go from the glazing into the wood. You wanna be rather gentle.
So I generally try to either I hover above or I place it right at the base of the glazing. And so instead of placing on the glass, what I'm doing is I place it right on the bottom of the glazing. So I'm not touching the glass, I'm touching the glazing. This is what sometimes is like a little difficult. Like if that feels finicky to you, what you really can do is you set this little tent up and you, well now I have, hold on, let me, uh, I have a thing. No, no, I'm not going to do that. Anyways, so, but in that case, what you can do is you can just go straight down and it'll kind of like, um, you know, bounce off that piece and like start heating the other part. Sometimes I like to check and make sure I'm not getting too much heat on this other part as well. And all I'm doing right here is that these pieces of glazing are just being are attached by the little bit of paint that's on the glass. So then taking this, um, the flat side and very gently just running it under that piece to separate that glazing from the paint. And you can see there's a little bit of residue kind of along this edge. And all you're going to do is kind of slowly go back in there, heat it up a little bit more, and kind of slowly work it off. I will say everybody has their favorite tool to deglaze windows. Like I personally have always loved the, um, this like painter's tool. Other people really like just regular putty knives. Some people, depending on how tough the glaze, will sometimes take a little chisel to kind of scrape it gently. But I find trying to use the gentlest method first and then seeing if you need to go through that process is, is the best course of action. And so this putty is coming out rather easily. This also kind of says to me that this is probably a newer type of glazing. Um, but also, because it's a newer type of glazing, it, it does make me concerned that it is coming out this easily. Um, you know, the one other one that I've kind of seen that's kind of like this, um, was it GAP33? GAP33, I think that's what it is. I don't use it, so I try not to remember it. Um, I find that it comes out rather easily whenever you want it to. Um, maybe it's kind of easy to use in kind of that process, but I find it doesn't last quite as long. I don't think the material of that glazing putty tends to work as effectively as an oil-based glazing putty. Um, although, I mean, everybody has their own opinion on it. Like everybody has their different types. I tend to go a little bit more traditional with the putty I use. And so I like to use the Sarco brand glazing putty. And so the Sarko brand glazing putty um, comes in a couple different varieties. Um, the one we'll use today is called the Type M glaze. Um, and that type, that glaze has specifically been kind of manufactured for use in a workshop or a heated or climate controlled setting. It has a drying or kind of like a drying agent in it, which allows it to dry kind of more quickly in like three to five days or even sooner than that, depending on your workshop. Um, 
However, if you use that outside, so say you're spot glazing outside, you use the type M glazing putty, it might dry out too fast and may cause it to dry too fast and detach from the wood or have other issues. Um, in that case, they have a different type of glaze called the dual glaze. And so um, that one is made specifically for exterior use or outside use. And part of that is that it doesn't have drying the same drying properties. And so it won't dry as quickly as um, the other one, but will weather properly in an exterior setting. I got a little stuck, sorry about that. Um, so I'm just continuing working around, trying to be rather careful. Um, it's coming out pretty easily. I'll do kind of initial first pass, and then from there what I tend to do is I will take a minute and suck up all the little bits and pieces, um, just so it doesn't get too messy. Sun glazing, if it's really hard, it's actually not good to leave too much on the glass for long periods of time, because that way you might end up scratching your glass. The glazing here is relatively soft, so I'm not quite as worried, but it's something to be aware of. You don't want to continue to leave abrasive material on, on your glass. I probably should talk, talk, stop talking for one hot second so we can kind of get through this one session. But make it there. So one issue that I always have problems with is getting all of the corners clean. And this is pretty, pretty important. Um, because sometimes if you're trying to get that piece of glass out and it's just not working and not working, honestly, it's always the corner or you've forgotten that glazing point. One or the other, most of the time. If not, it could be just like the smallest piece of glazing that could be just holding that glass in place depending on how tight it is. So, so just be back to the patients, just be patient. Find where the paint is sticking. Never force your glass up and out. You want to very gently test your glass when you take it out. Um, just so at the last moment, the last leg of the journey of taking the glass out, you don't break it in half. I think the one thing about glazing removal and paint removal and everything, it's a really great pass to get like a really good friend to help you with. Um, mainly because one person can hold the heat gun and run it along and you can just follow behind and kind of get that glazing right away. Um, it sometimes feels a little clunky when you're doing this by yourself. So that's where you rope in a friend for like a good few afternoons. What? <laughs> 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 if you have any questions, feel free. I'm sure Natalie can ask me then and I can do this so it's not quite as boring to watch. And test my multitasking skills. Normally I do this and I get caught up on all the podcasts and everything else that I kind of like lose track of. So 
one thing I just kind of hit here was like a little diamond point, blazing point. Um, so sometimes those blazing points can come out rather easily. Sometimes they're just a little bit more difficult. But same as everything else that I said is like, just take your time. Um, different tools can be useful and uh, make it easier. Um, so I often find having just a good needle nose plier or something in my toolkit often kind of takes care of those. Um, sometimes you'll have to like wiggle them back and forth a little bit. Um, when we'll get there, we'll talk a little bit more about the different types of placing points um, and kind of different uses or different, um, yeah, I guess different ones that you can find. Um, and also ones that might work best for your window because not all windows will, you know, not all glazing points will be good for all windows. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of talk to you, I'll, I'll talk about those a little bit as we go. Laura and Karen has a question. If there's a small crack in the glass, like in the corner, and it's a large pane, is there a way to glue the crack instead of just placing the entire pane of glass? Um, yeah, I think she's re-referencing it in the corner of the pane. Ah. Yeah. Um, I feel like I just read something. Sorry, I don't know where I'm talking anymore. Um, so I feel like I did just, I've read an article that there are certain things that you can like maybe glue pieces of glass together um, or maybe use like a tiny bit of epoxy. It's not something that I've done very often. Um, but it's a possibility as long as the crack, like, I mean, as long as the piece is not super big and it's not going to affect the, um, the strength and integrity. So if you had a piece that was like across the, you know, across the window like this, that's infecting, affecting the integrity. If it's, you know, like maybe like you're talking about, maybe just like a little piece over in the corner or, you know, just like a little piece in the corner, then I think there's potential ways to glue that one back together. But I honestly haven't, done that before. Um, most of the glass that I've had broken in sash have been very broken and not very salvageable. But it's something I I should look that up and see if there's kind of some new methods and everything. Um, the other thing is you can source wavy glass from places. Um, I think there are even some, man some manufacturers now that are recreating wavy glass. Ooh, this reminds me of one of the old window, wood window myths that's not, you know, like the ones before, but one I like to share because it kind of shattered my perception when I found this out from one of my old bosses. And so for the longest time, I thought that wavy glass was wavy because over time it was a liquid and so it uh, would kind of become wavy over time, which is in fact not true. Um, and some people know this, some people don't. I'm sure there's hopefully some people out there like me who are totally bought into the theory of wavy over time. But instead, it's actually due to the different manufacturing processes. Um, and that's why you might get little, uh, those little bubbles in your glass. Those are kind of, um, I've heard them described, they're called seeds. So you have little seeds in your glass. And, uh, but the waves, yeah, come from the different manufacturing process. And that's why you're going to see actually different types of waviness and different levels of waviness, depending on um, the age of your building, you know, where they bought their glass and everything like that. Um, but it, in fact, the waviness doesn't happen over time. I felt a little duped after learning that and believing that for many, many years. But, so. Is there a little an extra window pack you may or may not have wanted? So I'm just working along this final edge, and then we just have like a little bit more. Um, so I'm just getting some of those last little remnants. Some of this is a little stuck. It almost looks like a little, a little harder. But don't just try to like dry it out or just scrape the crap out of it. Like, you know, put a little heat on it. Most of the time that heat will help um, loosen that up enough so you can just kind of glide and glide on, um, over it and kind of remove it. So 
So yeah, um, and I continue my way around. Last couple of sections here. Um, one thing I also want to talk about is that if you're planning to do a big window project, there's a couple of things that could be really useful and kind of in the context of a lot of different like ergonomics of doing this. Um, so one thing you might notice is that this table isn't necessarily super low, but it's almost about waist height. And so when I'm working on this, I'm not going to hunch, have to hunch completely over to do the work. And so raising your window up to a point where it makes it easy to work on actually can make you more efficient. It's going to make sure your body doesn't hate you by the end. Um, and it's relatively easy. So this, this table, I actually, it's a Greg Rosal. He's wonderful. He also has taught me a lot um, about windows and causes. But what he did was build kind of just like a little like square structure underneath the plywood, which raised the level of this table up a little bit. And then it's just set on saw horses. Um, the other thing that I have on home at home, but unfortunately ran out of space in my car because it was packed like a sardine already, um, is a painting easel. And so this is a little bit more heavy duty one that I set, I can set sash up on. So when I'm painting, I'm not always leaning over painting or I'm not always glazing flat, like I glaze it more ergonomically like this or paint up and down more easily but just like and some of those are really easy to make a makeshift one with like a ladder and a couple pieces of wood I think there's a lot of different DIY things out there but yeah just think about it's I think important to realize that if you're going through this process to restore your windows and taking the time to do it that you you know choose ways that are going to be kind to your body and then just make it easier over time um, yeah, we might not be doing it a, a whole ton and everything, but I honestly, it's made a huge difference since I really privileged that more in my work. So. Um, Karen asked another question. Can cloudy glass be polished clear if it's been damaged? It's scratched, she doesn't turn it to use. So it was probably sandblasting. Hmm. Um. So, so one thing we will get to is we're going to talk a little bit about cleaning uh, cloudy glass. If it's sandblasted, that is, uh, well, that's awful, but um, potentially, I'm going to talk a little bit, it depends on the level of damage. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this like glass cleaning stuff, it's called sparkle, which is very cute, but um, but what it does is it's a little bit more of like it buffs thing, uh, the glass a little bit more to get kind of like that wear and the cloudiness away. And so it could, it could work, but if it was sandblasted, it depends on how deep those scratch, scratches go. Um, because if they go deep enough, even something like sparkle or kind of one of those might be too much. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, you, you might be able to ask more of like a glass expert about that. And there are ones out there. Um, so there's, especially like stained glass people often will work to restore pieces of glass because they, they want to maintain those pieces of glass if they can. Um, so, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about sparkle and it could work, it could maybe not. And so one thing I'm seeing here is I have a little glazing point and I'm removing that now before I go at this other glazing putty because I, like I said before, I don't, if I don't have to heat up a metal piece on top of that glass, I don't want to. I want to take as little chance as possible to break this during this process. Okay, last little section here. Mm -hmm. 
last little bit seems tougher. Okay, we're gonna finish this up so I can get to all the things. And and like I said, you know, there's a couple of videos that um, about you know mechanical restoration part and everything. And I'd rather show you kind of like all these little elements, and those will always be kind of a part of the additional materials that we'll send your way. Um, and I'm always happy to answer answer any questions about it. But we might have time to kind of take a brief gander at those as well. And also I answer just, you know, some questions that you might have about your own wood, wood windows. But even while I'm doing this, uh, if you have some questions about your windows or kind of issues that you're seeing or have any questions, keep them coming in. Natalie will keep asking me. We did have something pop up. So Linda um, did replace some windows at her house. Um, but there was one spot where the putty had been removed for so long that the wood underneath was weathered and softened. And so she wasn't sure or she, she wanted to be sure to like strengthen and repair the wood before glazing. Right, um, right. And so she said she ended up choosing the same with the partner that you can do the indoor wood surfaces. Okay, uh, for indoor wood surfaces? Mm -hmm. um, okay, um, yeah, so there's a lot of different wood hardeners and things out there. Um, my first, like, um, so today I'm talking about um, Apatron's system. I think their liquid word works really well. I think it's very intuitive and they often can come in like little homeowner kits, which means you don't have to buy gallons and gallons of um, epoxy because um, that's not often needed. But I've also used things like West systems and, and other ones that have been, you know, just as effective. Um, so the liquid wood is a penetrating epoxy. And so what that does is that it soaks into that wood and hardens it. Um, the other part, so if it's soft and squishy, so if you think there's some deterioration, the penetrating epoxy is also what people, what is called a consolidant. And so it's taking that wood and making it hard and come together again. So it's consolidating the wood. Um, and so I'm not sure if that's one you used or not, but um, using kind of a penetrating epoxy like that or a hardener is also going to be very good. Oh, other methods, if it's really weathered, then maybe not soft. Um, but you're looking to kind of restore it a little bit, you can do um, in a couple different ways. Um, so there's something called, um, there's boiled linseed oil. And so this is just black seed oil basically. And before, like up until a certain point and before um, latex and um, lead paint actually became the more prominent um, paint types, linseed oil paint was the most prominent type of oil-based paint. And oil-based paint was the most prominent type of kind of paint that was out there. And kind of an interesting fact that the Midwest and Minnesota in particular was one of the highest producing um, states for flax seeds and flaxseed oil and then thereby flaxseed paint. Um, and so we have a long legacy over here. Um, but the reason why it was so popular is that when it polymerizes, so it's um, uh, an lipid, lipids, I'm probably getting this wrong, but when it polymerizes, it's created, it will create a very strong coat and it will um, basically, um, it's basically going to um, create a very strong um, coat over it and become kind of a protective layer. So when conditioning wood, I use kind of either two, there's a couple different options. Um, one is that you can use um, a one-to-one -one ratio of linseed boiled, boiled linseed oil and um, uh, mineral spirits. And the other option is a one-to-one -one ratio of boiled linseed oil and turpentine. And so both of these, you can make that mixture and just kind of slowly um, put it onto bare wood, let it soak in. And so you want to do that until the point that um, 
It might start to look like it's not soaking anymore. You do not, you don't want, what you don't want, sorry, it's words. Um, what you don't want to do is to let it pool on the top. So if you're noticing it's pooling on the top, then what you're going to do is wipe that down because you don't want to, if that kind of dries, it'll actually create a very hard coating and might kind of decrease the effectiveness of your top coat of paint of choice. Um, or um, kind of what other else you might do. Um, besides that, um, I've also heard people use something called Penetrol, um, which is something that I think is pretty great. It just kind of like, you know, prepares the bed of your glass uh, and everything like that. Um, so I hope that that helps a little bit. Um, if it's really spongy wood, I tend to use liquid wood or a different penetrating, consolidating epoxy on it. And then from there, we'll, if it's really weathered or dry, then use kind of one of those conditioning methods. So, so I'm gonna turn this off and I'm going to suck this up so it's gonna keep even louder. So now that you've listened to that for a long while. So what we're going to do is, well, actually, so what I'm going to do is go around and take this off, damn it. I wish, um, so what I'm going to do is kind of see if there's areas that have more buildup than I think is going to allow the glass to come out. But what else I'm, what I'm, else I'm looking for is um, glazing points because these are going to be critical to take out before the glass has any chance of it coming out. I'm not seeing any glazing points. Most of them came out when I was doing some initial scraping and everything. Um, and so I also noticed that around the edge that it is bedded. So like if you do have a little glazing around the sides, that might kind of um, kind of keep it in a little bit. Um, see, it's in the corner. This is where I always forget to get some glazing. Um, and so that might kind of like stop it a little bit from um, coming out. But what I'm trying to do is just at least Get as much as possible and to guarantee as much as possible that this is going to come out without getting hung up on any of the little pieces of glazing that are, are here. So, so there we are. It's a very snug fit for this piece of glass and so that's kind of it's kind of just interesting to note. So when I'm doing this, like I said, you don't want to like force it. So if that's not coming out, maybe I'll try that corner. Right, this is way. So I'm just being very gentle. I'm kind of <clears throat> maybe noticing where there's a little bit too much glazing in the corners. And actually, this is where um, sometimes I'll like add this to my list of different window tools. But just like a, a little, just um, like razor blade kind of thing that you kind of find in your junk drawer or other places, or you know, you find the ten that you thought you lost. Um, and so what I like to do is like right around these edges that you can do just a little bit of detail work to get that glazing out where maybe that painter's tool or something else just doesn't work quite as well. I find them sometimes useful for the corners. Um, this is, this is a tool that kind of makes a comeback on every part of the, the window restoration process. So just be very careful. You don't want to like drag this along the, um, along the glass or anything. So I'm just checking this. 
it seems to be really stuck right here. So I'm just going to take a quick look. Get a little more of that around the edge. So that edge seems okay. I'm going to continue shifting this very weird. And try to do is just have it slightly off the table so that I can push it up and down. So this corner is stuck always. Okay. 